What up, motherfucks? It's a boy, the hater, up in this piece, you know what I'm saying? And we're gonna talk about AW a little bit. Now, here's the thing about this week's episode of AW, right? There were some good things that made it feel big time, made it feel a bit bigger than WWE feels most of the time. However, cucks, there were also a lot of things that made it feel low level, low production, okay? First things first, John Moxley comes out to Wild Things, or Wild Thing. Now that song, Wild Thing, da da da, what the fuck? I don't know, maybe that's his theme song in Japan. I don't know, quite frankly, I don't care. I don't know what his theme song is in AEW, so I don't really care, but it was noticeable, and it was weird. And it was Sim versus Blue Justice, Yuji Nagata. Now, Yuji Nagata, he's a name like you've, you've heard of, I'm sure. If you've ever watched New Japan, you've probably seen this guy in the first 10-man tag team match of every New Japan pay-per-view, right? Now this guy comes out here trying to, to beat Moxley on AW, and he comes out with the confidence of a Resident Evil supervillain, you know what I mean? And he comes out there, right, and he's like this old man. I mean, he's not even that old. He's like in his 50s, right? But he really looks it, you know? I believe that he looks it because, you know, he's been wrestling for a long, long time, so he's beat up. He's beat the shit, right? Like, The Rock is almost 50, and The Rock looks a million times better than, than Yuji Nagata, right? Because The Rock doesn't wrestle anymore, so he's just out there using millions of dollars to improve himself, to improve his body, taking the moroids or whatever it is that makes him so jacked. But this guy just looked like a 50-year-old man, right? And I don't care how tough he is, I don't care how tough they make him seem, it was comical at best, right? This is a guy that's a jobber in New Japan, and it, they said during the match that Yuji Nagata wants to wrestle until he's uh, 70 years old. That's another 17 years or 15 years, whatever the fuck it is, I think he's 53. I looked it up yesterday, but I don't remember, right? The match was what you would expect. John Moxley won, I don't know why. Um, the only benefit I can see from John Moxley winning this is to have John Moxley uh, defend the title again in AEW. You know what I mean? I guess a Japanese guy, because it did feel like a big deal, right? It's like, this guy's coming from a different country to take the title belt from Moxley, who stole it from New Japan, basically, right? Beyond that, I don't see any benefit. I mean, I guess you can have John Moxley go and become IWGP champion. I mean, that's the only explanation, right? Because it's like, you know, he's beating everybody here, you know? He's beating everybody there. And then, like, Will Ospreay or Cruiserweight is, like, the champion of New Japan? That doesn't make any sense. Um, the match was not good. Now, I know a lot of people uh, are going to say it was good just because of the fact that, like, oh, Yuji Nagata, the legend. Like, why is he a legend? You know, he's like, they, they talked about him during the match. And they're like, he's a four-time champion. Like, the four-time champion, it's like, he's like the Sheamus of New Japan, you know? Like, hard to be a legend. Like, let's not get ahead of ourselves. He's not like the, the Cena or the Randy Orton of New Japan. He's like the Sheamus of New Japan. You know what I mean? He's like the Drew McIntyre of, of New Japan. He's not a legend. So anyways, uh, afterwards, they have uh, an interview between Ortiz, uh, Jake Hager, and Sammy Guevara, right? I don't know. Santana was detained. I thought the storyline was that Santana was detained for using a fork during the match. Why wasn't MJF detained for throwing a man to his death? At least the fork was in the match. You know what I mean? Sammy Guevara... Like, just battered Jericho for no reason. Like, the match was over, and he attacked them afterwards. As a matter of fact, I kept thinking about that during the match. You know, that's one thing that they don't talk about in wrestling, right? They have, there's this idea in wrestling that things can just happen and be excused. You know, there's a time and place for this. Like, if you hit someone with a chair in the head during a match, that might not lead to criminal charges for the same reason why beating someone up in hockey might not lead to criminal charges if it happens during the game, right? Like... Someone punching someone in the face during a football game or shoving someone. These are not going to lead to criminal charges because it's part of the game. It's within the, the heat of the game. Now, if after, I don't know, if after whatever, whatever signifies the end of a hockey game, if the, when the bell rings, whatever the fuck they have, when the buzzer uh, buzzes in hockey, if someone just runs up to someone and just smacks them in the face with a hockey stick, that's battery, right? That's assault and battery in most, in most states. Um... Common law battery, motherfucks. You can't hit people with things, right, for no reason. So that's what MJF did here. So I would, I would like, argue that MJF's attack is way worse, obviously, 
Then Santana using a fork. That was really stupid. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know what the point of this promo was. Jack Swagger said that they failed and uh, they won a rematch. And I'm just like, dude, why do you want a rematch? Like, is, wasn't this supposed to be like the beginning and also the end of this feud? It is what it is. Then there's this announcement, this big announcement that Cucky Rhodes is going to, to make about double or nothing, which apparently is May 30th. So I'm like, all right, what's going to happen? Is he going to challenge for the world title and go back on his word? What's, is he going to add himself to that title picture? Who knows, right? He comes out and basically all he says was at the pay-per-view, I'm going to wrestle Anthony Agogo. That was the big announcement. The big announcement was I'm going to bury Anthony Agogo at the pay-per-view. Even if Cucky Rhodes wins, I mean loses, it doesn't really matter. Anthony Agogo is a go go going nowhere, mother You know what I'm saying? So I don't really care about this. This was a complete, complete waste of everyone's time. This entire feud is based on the fact that Anthony Agogo hit Cody Rhodes in the stomach once. It makes a lot more sense to have Cody Rhodes versus QT Marshall at the pay-per-view, like I said. But it is what it is. I don't know what the hell is going on. Uh, what? I don't even know what the hell is going on here. I'm reading some of the some of the things because I I forgot. And they're, they're saying some dumb shit here. Who cares? Next up, we had what actually was an awesome match. I'm not going to lie. I really, really enjoyed this. It was the Young Cucks, Matt and Nick Jansen, Jackson versus SCU, Fallen Angel, Christopher Daniels, of course, and uh, Frankie Kazarian, the future Frankie Kazarian. So here's the thing about this match. The match had a lot of false finishes, but this is an example of when false finishes really, really, really make sense, right? This is a big deal. This was, this was supposed to be the end of SCU. And even though we all kind of knew it was going to be the end of SCU, because typically in wrestling, as soon as a, a team says, if we lose one more match, that's it for us, that means they're going to go on a win streak and then eventually lose uh, and be done with, right? So this was good because SCU really, really felt like they were going to win a few times. Like Daniels kicked out of like the super kick. Daniels kicked out of like a bunch of shit. Kazarian saved them, vice versa, you know. It was a really hard-fought battle. The Young Bucks cheated um, because fucking the Good Brothers were there interfering every 20 seconds. I didn't really like the Good Brothers interfering here. Um, Luke Gallows looked like a retard. He was wearing a tie-dye shirt, like a fedora, and a dangly earring. I mean, like, I understand that he's trying to be, like, ironically cool. Like, he's trying to wear all this wax shit to say, like, I'm so cool that I can wear whack shit, but because he's not cool, it just comes off, like, the, the parody doesn't work, the irony doesn't work, he just comes off as a nerd, he just comes off as a guy that would wear this unironically, you know what I mean, because he has that weird potato head, you know, and he has no charisma, and neither does Carl Anderson, and neither do the Young Bucks, so all, all they do is come out there, and they look like assholes, right, they, they just, like, it's very strange, because, like, uh, Gallows and Anderson were supposed to be like the serious guys in, uh, in the Bullet Club, right? They're supposed to be the serious guys, along with like Tama Tonga and those guys, and the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega pretty much ruined everything, and now these guys are emulating them, you know? And it's really weird seeing a big, big guy like uh, fucking Luke Gallows doing this kind of stuff uh, when you know he is like a bad dude, like you can just tell he's not a, he's not a pussy, but whatever, it is what it is, right? Eventually, Daniels and Kazarian lose after Daniels uh, takes a super kick to the face. This is really cool. Uh, one of the Jacksons, like he imitated HPK and Rick and, and uh, Rick Flair, and but Daniels kicked out of it, which was interesting. And then they hit the BTE trigger, and that was the end of that, motherfucks. Then Dasha has an interview with Christian Cage, which, by the way, his entire like debut has been handled in the most horrible way imaginable. Like they debuted him as a big announcement, and then all he's done is have like two matches. Doesn't make any sense, you know. It would have been better to just have him debut at Double or Nothing in the Casino Battle Royal and have him win it. That would be a, a great way to debut. Because the matches that he's had thus far have had no meaning. You know what I mean? He gets interrupted by Matt Seidel, a.k.a. Evan Bourne. Right? Evan Bourne's like, I'm going to beat you. And I'm like, the fuck is this, right? Evan Bourne's like a foot shorter than him. And Christian was one of the smaller guys in WWE. Evan Bourne is like a full foot shorter Right, and he somehow looks older too. I don't know, like the neck, Evan Bourne's neck just looked really old. So it was what it was. This is going to be the match. No one really cares. It was really stupid. Um, I am not looking forward to this match. 
Then we have freshly squeezed Orange Cassidy versus Pac. Um, this match doesn't end. Nothing really happens here. Um, basically, Kenny Omega attacks Pac, and that's the end of that, motherfucks. That's the end of that. Um, they both fall to the ground. Ten count becomes a triple threat match like we all knew it would, right? Uh, I guess that's better than nothing, but this does not feel like a main event by any means, you know? And it honestly just shouldn't be the main event. The main event should just be like Moxley and Kingston versus the Young Cucks. So the Young Cucks and the Good Brothers uh, cut a promo, and basically John Moxley and Eddie Kingston will have a match with them, a double or nothing, probably for the titles, which means, once again, the rankings mean zero, right? Alex Marvez uh, is talking to Adam Page in the Dark Order. Uh... I don't know. It's basically going to be a rematch between Brian Cage and Adam Page. This is just a throwaway match. Like, Team Taz is obviously in a feud against Christian. Yet, for some reason, now they've pivoted to Brian Cage versus Adam Page again. The reason might be because Christian has to go win that, uh, whatever, Casino Battle Royal. And therefore, shit needs to go down. But still, it's weak. It's whack. It makes no sense. Brian Cage, by the way, should be featured prominently uh, every week on AW. Then uh, the Pinnacle comes out and Tolly Blanchard cuts one of the worst promos I've heard in my life. This guy doesn't know what the fuck he's saying, you know? Like, I think it's because he's unmotivated. He seems like a really sharp guy. I mean, I've never seen him, like, you know, up until now. Like, I didn't know who the fuck he was until a few years ago. But maybe he was good at cutting promos back in the day. But he's a sharp guy, so I don't think it's like... He, he's not good at cutting promos. I just think he doesn't give a shit and didn't rehearse this. He probably doesn't know these people's names. You know? So, uh, he cuts a promo. The promo is complete garbage. It wasn't good. Then, uh, uh, what's it called? Inner Circle come out with like a, basically like to recreate The Rock and Kurt Angle promo, right? Where The Rock gives uh, the corporation a beer bath. But instead they come out with a champagne filled truck. Now the camera work and the production value is so shit that when they, when they zoom in on the, on the truck, you can clearly see Jericho behind them. And I'm like, oh, Jericho's right there. He's going to come out as part of some big surprise. But I'm like, I saw him clear as day, motherfucks. Clear as day. You know? So Jericho comes out and he just continues the promo. It's like this weird reveal. It's like, why is Sammy Guevara leading them when Jericho's right there? And Jericho's like, we want a rematch. And then, like, MJF says, no, no, no. J uh, Sammy Guevara hits him with, like, a... Uh, little champagne water gun, right? And then this allows, first of all, everyone starts slipping and falling like a bunch of retards in the ring. And Sammy Guevara is, is like, continues doing it until MJF is like, all right, you got your rematch. It's gonna be stadium stampede. But if you lose, the inner circle has to break up forever. Now, I don't really care if the inner circle breaks up forever, but what does this mean for Santana and Ortiz? Do they have to break up too? Or can they just become a tag team? Can Jericho and Sammy Guevara just become a tag team? You know what I mean? Like, what the fuck does this mean, right? Hopefully they don't lose because I'm, I'm enjoying this inner circle way more. And I'm enjoying them way more than the pinnacle as well. But I'm also enjoying them more than the old inner circle that was heels. Inner circle was cool when it first started because it's like one thing we hadn't seen ever is a stable based around Jericho, you know? And I think this is a pretty good stable, uh, all things considered, you know? All things considered. It's not a great stable. But it's better than, like, whatever that bullshit on NXT, like, hit row. What the fuck is that all about, by the way? Hey, anyways, let's move forward from this, right? Um, so, obviously, the match is going to happen. And uh, hopefully, Inner Circle wins. Not just for that, but I don't want him to lose two of these in a row, you know? Uh, Jericho, I mean, Jim Ross had an interview with uh, Britt Baker. And um, Britt Baker is getting a title shot against Hikaru Shida. I'm pretty sure Britt Baker is going to win. Britt Baker should win. Britt Baker is obviously, like the best wrestler they have in the, in the female division. So there you go. Thunder Rosa beats a broad named Jasmine. No one cares. Uh, Tony Schiavone did an interview with Jade Cargill. Oh, I forgot about Jade Cargill. She should be the champion. She should be the champion. Uh, yeah, there's no point in making uh, Britt Baker the champion when you have Jade Cargill. Yeah, it makes much more sense to have Jade Cargill beat uh, Hikaru Shida. That makes more sense to me. Then we have uh, Darby Allen versus Miro. Okay. Um, I don't know what to think about this. Other than one thing. First of all, this is the biggest mismatch I've ever seen in my life. Since like Big Show versus Spike Dudley. This is right there. Except Big Show and Spike Dudley was not treated the way that this was treated. 
Big Show and Spike Dudley was treated like Big Show is going to destroy this guy in 20 seconds. And that's exactly what would happen, right? This was treated as a semi-competitive match. Now, Miro looks like an absolute monster, right? This guy is a big, big dude. You know what I mean? Miro is one of those guys, one of those few people in this world that you can look at and be like, this is a bad motherfucker. Not because of the fact that he has like a look or anything like that, but just because of the sheer breadth of this man. The width of this guy is preposterous, right? He's one of those guys, like, you know when I say like, you know, like Conor McGregor cannot hurt someone like Mike Tyson? Like Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson motherfucks, who can hurt anyone, I think would have problems with someone like Miro. I'm talking about in his prime. That's how, how intimidating and how powerful looking Miro is. Miro is not one of those guys that you look at and you're like, yeah, this guy would get his ass kicked by a UFC superstar. Which a lot of people say a lot, by the way. It's fucking retarded. People are like, oh, Conor McGregor would destroy Sheamus. No, he wouldn't, motherfucks. Sheamus would break Conor McGregor in 20 pieces in 5 seconds. Believe you me. Right? But someone like Miro, I would, I might take him over like a light heavyweight. Like, honestly, I'm not even joking. If someone was like, John Jones versus Miro, I think I'd take Miro. Just as just, good just the sheer strength differential. Like, Miro, if he grabs this guy, it is a wrap. And I think Miro is one of those people that cannot be hurt by normal men. Like, he's just a strong, bull, mule-like motherfucker, right? He's like almost like a Brock Lesnar in his prime. You know, he really is of that ilk, right? Brock Lesnar in his prime, I don't give a fuck who you are. You know, people are like, oh, Francis Ngannou, the best heavyweight. Steve A. Miocic, the best heavyweight. Brock Lesnar in his prime, nobody's fucking with that guy, motherfuckers. So that's how I feel about Miro. That being said, it's now Miro versus Darby Allen, who is, in my opinion, the smallest wrestler in the history of wrestling to ever be taken this seriously. I don't think I've ever seen a wrestler this small have this much hype. Ever, motherfucks. Ever. You see what I'm saying? Not once. Like, no wrestler this small has been treated this well. Like, think of who's like probably before this guy, the best treated small guy wrestler. It could be Spike Dudley, but obviously he got his ass beat all the time. You could argue Crash Hawley, but Crash Hawley, all he did was become European champion for like five minutes, right? Um, you could argue who? Who else? That's it, man. Rey Mysterio, obviously. But Rey Mysterio, as we all know, is a complete and utter outlier. Rey Mysterio is a different story, right? And Rey Mysterio was never renowned to be this tough guy. He was just like a quick, quick person. Rey Mysterio shouldn't even count that because he's Rey fucking Mysterio, motherfucks. So there we have... Darby Allen wrestling this match with Miro under the premise that Darby Allen has a chance. Miro attacks it from behind and just starts throwing this guy around like he's a nobody. Really asserting himself as the beast that Miro is. Like, honestly, one good thing about Miro as opposed to Rusev is the fact that he is in so much better shape now. So much better shape. He is much better now than he was back then. You know, he is in his prime right now. Like, no fucking joke, man. He looks legit. You know, he is a brick house, right? So Miro's out there just breaking this guy apart, just treating him like a child. It was almost ridiculous. It, it literally would be as if it was like me when I'm like 25, 26 versus like a 10 year old. That's the, the, the discrepancy, or even me now, I suppose, but you know what I mean? Like, like, a, like a man in his prime and his youth versus a child is what this felt like. Because Darby Allen felt like someone that hadn't grown into his body yet. That's what he feels like, motherfucks. And Nero is beating the shit out of this guy. And I'm thinking to myself, this, uh, I mean, the buck has to stop somewhere, right? It's like Darby Allen cannot beat Nero. That's ridiculous. Yeah? And luckily, he doesn't. After Darby Allen does a few of his Darby Allen moves, he did do, I will say this, I'll give him credit, he did a tope suicida from the, uh, through the bottom and middle rope. And he was a fucking rocket when he did this. He hit Miro, and I'm like, dude, this could actually hurt someone bad. Because he, li he literally threw all his weight into Miro. And it looked legit. So I'm not going to sit here and say Darby Allen sucks. I actually like Darby Allen. Like, all things considered, Darby Allen is not bad. You know? He's not bad. He's easily top five AW guys. Easily. Like, it's not even... He might be number one out of everyone in AW. You know? Except for Christian Cage, of course. And, like, maybe Powerhouse Hobbs or... You know, Team Taz in general. But that's about it. Like, he's he's right there, you know. He's probably better than those guys, except for Christian. So, I like Darby Allen, you know. But there comes a point where certain things become ridiculous. Like, Darby Allen going out there 
you know, and, and, and having a competitive match against Brian Cage or having a competitive match against uh, Miro is just ridiculous. Like, it's not even, it's not reasonable, motherfuckers. It's not reasonable. So he got his ass beat. Uh, Miro did the accolade and he kind of like turned it into almost like a sleever because he went on his back and he kept doing the accolade while he was on his back and Darby Allen was being hoisted upwards, almost like a surfboard, right? And he hit him with the accolade, Darby Allen. I don't know, I don't know if he tapped out or passed out. I don't know, I don't care. He won, right? And then the next challenger is everybody dies. Like the murder cuck monster came out, right? This is ridiculous, man. What the fuck is this guy doing? Everybody dies. This guy is a jobber. Let's be real. This has been a complete and utter flop. The murder hawk monster is a loser. Okay? He like Miro is better than him. This guy should be destroyed by Miro swiftly. But I'm, I'm not saying that Lance Archer is total garbage. I'm just saying that Lance Archer missed his beat. Lance Archer is a guy that's been around, like he's been entertaining me personally for 20, 25 years, ever since he was Lance Hoyt in uh, TNA. Lance Hoyt was much more interesting in my opinion. That's either here nor there. Lance Archer is not good. He, the, he, the murder hawk monster gimmick is not good. Okay, his hair looks like shit. Uh, he's not serious. He comes out with Jake the Snake Roberts, who looks like he's like one week away from death of natural causes. The abuse that Jake the Snake Roberts has done to himself will never be corrected, motherfucks, unfortunately. That's what happens when you abuse yourself. You can be in your 60s. How old is Jake the Snake? He's got to be like 60, right? Uh, let's see here. Jake the Snake Roberts. Jake the Snake Roberts. Motherfucks! He is born in 55, which I believe by my math makes him 65 years old. 65, he, he looks like he's dying, man. You know, it is what it is. I just need Jake the Snake Roberts to, like, be careful so he doesn't die. Uh, with that being said, Mother Fox, it's very, very important, very, very important um, that this, ha this feud, if one starts, is handled correctly. What the fuck is Sting's role in this? I want to know what happens. So, uh, but as far as the match goes, I'm not excited for it at all. Like, if they end up doing Miro versus Lance Archer at uh, the pay-per-view, I, I don't care. And that's a throwaway match to me. Throwaway match, you know? I'd rather see Miro versus Darby Allen again because it was an entertaining match only because you have a big, strong guy tossing around a little guy who has no chance, you know? Uh, this episode wasn't good just because Darby Allen being positioned as a guy that has a chance is not good. But I will say this. There were several moments in this uh, event that felt big time. This is another... Uh, event with some pay-per-view quality matches. Like the Young Bucks match was fantastic, I thought. Uh, the main event, even though it wasn't believable, it was fun, and it was a title shot. A title change as well. And then I will say this, motherfucks. I will say, Yuji Nagata coming, I don't care about him. But the fact that someone's coming from another promotion, and it's someone that's been positioned by that promotion, and is now treated by this promotion, AEW, as a legend, does add some gravitas. The fact that a title from another promotion is being defended does give it some of that global appeal. You know, you got to think there's got to be one or two, probably not more than one or two, hardcore New Japan fans from Japan, I mean, that, that were like, oh, Eugene Nagata is going to wrestle some guy in the United States, that, the guy who's the US champion here. And they probably went and watched the show just to watch that match. And maybe one out of those two was like, oh shit, it's Rusev. What the hell's going on here? I thought he was in WWE. You know? And they might stick around, right? That's pretty good. That person might watch next week. That's how wrestling fans start. So I thought it was a decent show overall, but a lot of negatives. And the negatives are really, really consequential. They are indicative of the problem of AW. You know? But we'll get we'll get we'll get to that later, motherfuckers. We'll get to that another time. Cuck boys! Alright, bitches, see you later, motherfuckers.